Welcome to day two of our 2021 BioMain and MCE Life Sciences Summit. My name is Agnieszka Carpenter and I'm the Executive Director for BioMain. Um, and this event is actually co-organized by BioMain and Main Center for Entrepreneurs. Yesterday was day one of the event and we focused on the MCE Life Science programs. We talked about the Bio Startup program, technology transfer, and I know that not everyone had a chance to join us yesterday. So we have um, Tom Rainey, Executive Director of MCE with us today, who I wanted to introduce. And Tom, if you could give us a little recap of how MCE is involved in bioscience and what yesterday was all about for everybody who wasn't there. Great, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining. Uh, so again, I'm Tom Rainey, Executive Director of the Maine Center for Entrepreneurs. And um, the Maine Center for Entrepreneurs has been around since 1997. We were one of uh, a number of business incubators that were founded um, by the state to try to diversify the Maine economy. And um, we have launched a couple of industry-specific programs, one around food and beverage. And uh, we focused very heavily on, on that over the last couple of years. And we thought we could apply a lot of the things, things we've learned around supporting that important industry in Maine in the life sciences space. So um, we came together with a number of, of partners around the state and applied for an, a US Department of Commerce EDA grant to develop what we were calling the, the Maine Bioscience Cluster. And the cluster is made up of three different components. Um, the first is BioInnovate, which is really focused on technology commercialization and working with our research performing institutions around the state. Um, and that's managed by Todd Keeler with Maine Health. And um, the second component is Bio Startup, which is really focused on, as the name implies, working with uh, early stage startup bioscience companies. And that program is managed by Paul Fitzpatrick. Um, the third component of the EDA grants is develop the development of this program, putting on uh, an annual uh, workshop or annual summit uh, event that highlights all of the exciting things happening around the state of Maine. So on day one, we focused on the tech transfer piece in the morning. We had a great panel uh, discussion with some of our leading research performing institutions. Um, the conversation was, was moderated by uh, Greg uh, Fryer, who was with Barrow Law Firm, who did an excellent job of uh, covering all the topics, a lot of the exciting things happening around the state in, uh, in, in tech transfer and commercialization. And then Paul uh, Fitzpatrick led a conversation with five of the companies that have just finished the bio startup program. And it was really great to hear what they're working on, how they've advanced their companies. And Paul was, um, uh, was really keen on and recruiting the next cohort of companies. So we're putting the word out that uh, we have positions available. Um, uh, registrations are open. We'd love to have more companies join that initiative. Uh, we have two more years on this US Department of Commerce EDA grants for the bioscience cluster. And uh, we're hoping that it'll take on a life of its own and we'll continue to operating this program you know, into the future. So uh, with that, I'll hand it back to Agnieszka. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Tom. And I just wanted to reiterate again that we're super excited to be co-organizing this. I think you know we're really focused on collaboration this year. And so that's a great initiative to have this event um, organized by two institutions in Maine with um, you know, a lot of our mission, a lot of our missions um, overlap. Um, okay, so let's start with this. Uh, first thing I want to do is to thank all of our sponsors. Um, you know, both BioMain and MCE are very fortunate to have so many great organizations supporting us. And without you, we wouldn't be able to do the program today or a lot of the work that we're doing every day. Thank you so much. We appreciate your continued support. And now I'm just going to go over the agenda today and so some housekeeping items. So we just started with welcome remarks. Um, I'm going to give some Biomain updates, just focusing on, on what Biomain has been doing in 2021. Then we'll go to our keynote address. We have an amazing speaker. I hope everybody's excited for Juan Enriquez. That's at 9.30. Uh, we will have a little Q&A at the end. So around 10 p.m., sorry, 10 p.m., 10 a.m. Um, and please leave your questions in the chat box. The chat box is on. Um, we will really appreciate questions from you. And then at 10.10, 10, we're doing a 10 minute break and then we'll be back right at 10.20 for a very engaging panel discussion. 
Navigating Life Science, Business and Workforce in 2021. And we have speakers from Jackson Labs, IDEX, the Rue Institute and Main, Main Community College System. And that panel is moderated by, by Toby Ahrens from Focus Maine. And then we should be wrapping up around 11.30. So I'm excited and um, hope for a really good program today. I, I know it's going to be good, but you know, just to, to ramp up some excitement. Um, okay, so we are going to start with the BioMain updates. And I realize that some of you may not actually be familiar with BioMain because I think some of our audience is coming more from the MCE community. So I wanted to just tell you what BioMain is and what we do. So we are Bioscience Association of Maine and we're a membership-based organization we're the only life science trade association in the state of Maine. Membership based, we have over 220 members. And our mission is to advance economic growth. Oh, sorry about that. Just trying to move the um, pictures. So, so our mission is to advance economic growth and opportunities in the life sciences community of Maine. And I always stress the word community. We're not here just for the industry, but we're encompassing everybody, uh, you know, academia, researchers, students, service company, anyone who does any sort of work with life sciences, we're very inclusive. Uh, and so we fulfill our mission through five different areas of activity. And those are events. And today is one of those events. Um, education, so we work with schools on all levels. And I'll talk about that a little later. Um, workforce development, a very hot topic for everybody, including life sciences. Economic development, uh, I mentioned that we're focused on collaboration. We work with a lot of partner organizations. Um, MC is one of them, Focus Maine, MTI, Educate Maine, and many, many others. Um, and, you know, all of our organizations look to Maine's future and Maine's economy growing. And then last but not least, advocacy is another area of activity for us that we're really trying to propel this year. And I'll talk about that towards the end. Okay, so I actually thought that I would make this a little more interactive than just my remarks. And I wanted to ask you a question. And the question is, what does Maine's bioscience industry need to advance in your opinion? Um, so I wanted to wake everybody up, it's 9 a.m. And if you could type in your answer in the chat right now, if you're shy, you don't have to, but um, just one word or a couple words, what do you think Maine's bioscience industry need to advance? Okay, so I'm gonna start reading these answers here. I see translational research, public understanding, equity and inclusion, more entrepreneurs from Paul, more aggressive state funding to compete with neighboring states, connection and awareness, to maintain strong connections throughout New England, to attract scientists to the state for continued growth, collective self-confidence that Maine can do this. Yes, I love this. Lab infrastructure. Absolutely. Um, it's really great to see your answers. Uh, I'm not going to read all of them, but please continue if you would like. Uh, more coordination between the various organizations. Yes, 100%. So we actually ask this question because every year we send out a survey to our community and I compiled some of the answers here. So we have one of them is qualified life science workforce. We have qualified life science workforce, but we need more to grow. Adequate training programs. We'll hear from our schools a little later during the panel. Strong business incentives for new and existing companies. Someone mentioned that in the chat. We are really looking at you know, other states trying to learn some lessons on what the incentives should be here for bioscience to grow. Collaborative environment, um, I mentioned collaboration, it's really key. Good infrastructure and capital and investment. 
Um, so we want to see some dollars being poured into the growth of life sciences here in the state. And the reason why I put this um, question here is because I just wanted to stress that BioMaine is really focused on strategy and really looking to the future of Maine. And all of these ideas are shaping our plan and our strategic plan. And so with that, I'm going to now talk about events because we believe that getting people together is one way to really start exploring all of these topics and to you know, being aware of what's happening and do things in a collaborative manner. So in 2021, um, we you know, had to do quite a lot of virtual events as you may probably be aware. Um, so one of the formats that really works for us is the virtual coffee hour. So in 2021, so far we have done six of those. Some of them are themed. Uh, we did one on AI, we did one on aquaculture. Some of them are more general. And the idea is to bring together scientists, entrepreneurs, um, you know, new companies, existing companies, any opportunities that exist in the state and to keep people informed and educated. It also spurs a lot of networking in a different way since we can't really do too many networking events yet, but um, it is you know, a, a little bit of a different way to get to know people. And then we also put together our signature events. Um, so Biomin Student Showcase is a competition for students with cash prizes. Uh, we did our legislative update online this year, and normally it's a reception. Um, and then Women in Bioscience, just a couple of weeks ago, and that event actually was a hybrid event. So we did programming in the morning and then a networking reception at the Rue Institute in the evening. And another in-person that we were able to do was our summer networking reception in, back in August at the beautiful Biddeford UNE campus. Um, it was glorious. And I'm hoping we can do more in-person. I know a lot of people are itching to do some in-person networking. In the wintertime, it may be a little bit hard, but we will do our best. And we'll definitely continue with the coffee hours. Uh, our next one's actually November 4th. So please keep your eyes uh, you know, on the calendar. These, if you're subscribed to our emails, you'll see all of these events coming your way. Okay, so another area of focus that I mentioned or actually two of them is STEM education and workforce development. And I'm happy and proud to report that we are investing $75,000, $75,000 in Maine's future workforce via scholarships and awards. And this is the number that we have come up with for 2021. And we do so in a couple of different ways. So the Biomain Scholarship Program, that's something brand new to us. We just rolled it out um, back in, I think, February or March. It was a long way coming. Uh, and these are four different awards that we offer to main life science majors, both undergrads and grads. Um, and the four of them are the internship award. This is for summer internships to help with the cost you know, of living. Sometimes those internships are unpaid. Uh, the second one is our academic scholarship. That one helps with tuition costs and cost of living. The third one is research seed grant. So for students who have research projects and need a little bit of funding and then a travel award for students who present at conferences. All of these things, you know, there's a lot of cost associated with it. And we want to make sure that our main life science college students have opportunities. And when they need a little bit of help, we are there to provide that. Uh, most of these awards are about $4,000 each. So if you are a life science student or if you know any, maybe your kids are, please help us spread the word. It's a new program. All the information is on our website and all you need to do is to apply. Um, another way we invest money in our students is uh, for middle schoolers. So we we fund four science summer camps uh, every summer at the main school for science and mathematics in Limestone. It's a really cool school. The camp is one week long and it's a really re a rewarding experience for us and for the students. And it's great to see uh, middle schoolers who are really passionate about science to go there and explore and come back with lots of memories. 
Um, and the third way I mentioned that before is the Biomain Student Showcase, and that's a competition for students um, from high schools and colleges where they present their research and then their cash prizes. Uh, the level of research in Maine among especially high school students is absolutely amazing. If you've missed these events, uh, the last one is actually available on demand so you can watch it. And I promise you will be totally amazed. Um, so, you know, our mission is to, part of our mission is to keep talent in Maine. Um, and we believe that by investing actual dollars in our students, uh, we can create some pretty great workforce for the future needs of our life science community. Uh, moving on to Maine Bioscience Day, that's another STEM education um, project that we have launched a couple years ago. Um, it's a day in November. Now it moved more into a week in November because we are growing it, where we basically send scientists to schools to talk about science, to talk about their daily jobs, um, and also to raise awareness of the kinds of companies that are available, the kinds of careers that we have here in the state. So if you look on the right, you'll see some really smiley students doing some hands-on activities in middle schools. Um, it usually all happens on the same day, so it's a huge coordination project. But, uh, you know, in 2020, we had to pivot a little bit to make it into a virtual event. And I'll actually play a video, just a two-minute video in a minute, to show you what we did in 2020. Before I do that, I wanted to bring your attention to these numbers here. So you can see that in 2018, we reached 14 schools. In 2019, it was 23 schools. In 2020, we actually doubled that, so 46. And we were able to reach schools from all over Maine because that event was virtual. So that was actually quite a positive side effect of the pandemic, and we're continuing that this year. So I hope this video will work for you. Let's try it. Hi, I'm Patrick. Welcome to Maine Bioscience Day. 2020 called for a reimagining of Maine Bioscience Day. COVID-19 restrictions meant our traditional program of bringing volunteers into schools for live presentations wouldn't work. Instead, we went virtual, creating lesson plans for teachers and producing a series of videos to enhance those lessons. We profiled three main scientists, Tori Dennis, an associate scientist at IDEX, Chuck Labelzik, a vector ecologist at the Maine Medical Center Research Institute, and Patrick Breeding from Myron Skin Care, who served as our guide through all the videos. There are hundreds and thousands of career paths that you can choose from in the field of bioscience. Using a combination of video and written materials, middle school students were able to learn about genetic traits. Can you roll your tongue into a U shape? Let's try it. It looks like we both can. The hands-on PTC test activity also turned out to be a big hit. Did you taste anything? No. <laughs> I didn't either. 46 Maine Middle Schools signed up to take part in Maine Bioscience Day, double the number that participated last year. The virtual format also allowed schools from across Maine to participate, including Greenville and Presque Isle. Those schools and many others also took part in our live Q&A sessions where students were able to interact directly with the scientists. I can have 96 wells of cells and I can test 96 different antibodies at the same time. In all, more than 5,000 students took part in this year's Maine Bioscience Day and the feedback from educators has been very positive. We were so impressed with 2020's programming uh, Maine Bioscience Association took pretty much everything into account for remote, hybrid, some combination of learners. The students so enjoyed hearing from local scientists doing cool jobs. It was their first time really being exposed to genetics. They really enjoyed doing the traits inventory. In an unprecedented learning year for Maine students, we found a way to engage more schools and students in Maine Bioscience Day and hopefully inspire the next generation of scientists. Okay, great. I think it worked, I hope. Um, so this year, Maine Bioscience Day will take place on November the 15th to 19th. And once again, we're not really allowed in schools yet. And, you know, we just want to make everybody comfortable. So we're producing three videos again. This year, the companies involved are, I, I'm sorry, Abbott, MDIBL, 
and Northeast Laboratory Services. Uh, I actually watched the Abbott video this morning. It's uh, really awesome. It's Dr. Norman Moore. And then we have a hands-on activity and we're actually sending materials to schools. We're hoping to reach over 50 schools this year. So, you know, I just wanted to mention that that's a little bit expensive to be producing these videos and sending materials. And there are ways in which our you know, community can support us. The cost is pretty minimal, but you're supporting a really cool initiative. So if you're interested in that opportunity and you want your logo on the video, you know, being displayed to so many schools, contact us after this event. Sorry, I had to do this plugin. Um, it, it's a truly, truly rewarding event that we organize. A lot of work, but it's totally worth it. Okay, so moving gears a little bit, I'll talk about advocacy. Um, so, you know, Biomain has always been involved in advocating on behalf of the industry here in the state, but we really wanted to organize it a little better and to propel it to the next level. So in 2021, we put together an advocacy committee and that committee meets regularly. We are now working with a consultant and we're gearing up towards the next upcoming legislative session. We want to keep our um, state legislators informed and educated. We also want to keep you, our membership and our community informed on what's happening in Augusta, monitoring all the bills. Um, so I just put here some of our legislative priorities and they're to promote a supportive tax and regulatory environment, to strengthen incentives for innovation and business, to increase capital, to advance bioscience in the state, and to build strong bioscience workforce by supporting STEM education and workforce development initiatives. So any bills that touch these topics, we will be monitoring. And I also wanted to say, if anybody feels strong about this and would like to get involved, you know, our advocacy committee will be open soon to volunteers. And we really do need your support and your involvement in this because as a small association, there's only so much we can do. But to really make a change and to um, make sure that our legislators understand what this industry is and how critical and pivotal it is for the future of Maine's economy, we need more voices. So um, yeah, stay tuned. There will be some emails going your way with legislative updates, updates this year. And then another project I wanted to mention, I'm just checking my time here, um, is that we are updating our industry report. You may be familiar with this publication. We released it in 2019 and the cover looked like this. Um, it's available both in printed form and digital. If you're interested in that, it's actually on our website, available for a free download. And the data in this report is from 2018. So some of the data points you can see here, I just wanted to give you an idea of what you can find in it. You know, the number of life science companies. Um, this is the one I always showcase because it's a cool, it's a cool graphic. So it shows you the life science job industry growth over the past five years. And you'll see that obviously Massachusetts is leading the way as the number one biotech hub in the world. But then when you look at other New England states, you'll notice that some of the states here actually you know, um, observed a negative job growth, but in Maine, the five-year job growth has been at 14%, which is number two in New England. So that's pretty significant. And I'm very excited to see the data for 2020. Um, so the idea and you know the goal we have is that the report will be released at the end of this year. So we're now working very hard to gather all the data, analyze it, um, we know for sure that the jobs have grown even more because of COVID. Hopefully that number will stay. So please stay tuned. And there are also ways in which you can support this report. Um, lots of cool data in the report. This is just a very small snapshot. Okay, and now I'm ready to introduce the speaker, but I'm not sure if we have him. Uh, I am right here. Hello, Juan. Hello. Sorry, it's hard for me to um, manage the presentation and also monitor the participants, but we couldn't be more excited to have you here, and I wanted to introduce our speaker today, so I have my notes. Juan Enriquez uh, is a leading authority on the economic impact of life sciences and brain research on business and society, as well as a respected business leader and entrepreneur. 
He's author and co-author of multiple bestsellers, including As the Future Catches You, How Genomics Will Change Your Life, Work, Health, and Wealth, and a book that I actually have in my library, Evolving Ourselves, Re Redesigning Humanity, One Gene at a Time, highly recommended. You can get it on Amazon. Um, Juan is a TED All-Star with 10 TED Talks on a variety of subjects, as well as dozens of TEDx Talks. Uh, my personal favorite is called, Will Our Kids Be a Different Species? I actually have three kids, so it's very relevant to me. Um, Juan was the founding director of the Harvard Business School's Life Sciences Project and is a research affiliate at MIT Synthetic Neurology Lab. After um, Harvard Business School, Juan became an active angel investor, founding Bioteconomy Ventures. He then co-founded Excel Venture Management, Juan serves on multiple for-profit for boards, as well as a variety of nonprofits, including the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Boston Science Museum, Harvard Medical School, and a couple others. Um, Juan graduated from Harvard with a BA and MBA, both with honors. The full bio is on our website. I also wanted to say that I have never introduced a speaker with a more impressive resume. So Juan, thank you for that. It's a true honor and welcome to Maine. Um, and whenever you're ready, the stage is yours. Well, thank you. Um, I am a very happy Maine resident. Um, I have a house in Pemaquid. I spent most of the last uh, year and three quarters there. Um, so Maine has been incredibly good to me. And Maine has an incredible life science um, infrastructure that I hope we can continue to grow and build. Um, I'm going to make this talk about um, something that might seem a tiny bit orthogonal to what you normally do. Uh, I'm going to talk about right and wrong. Um, and you can see that, right? OK. Um, so in the process of talking about right and wrong, you might have noticed that we are slightly polarized these days. Uh, there's a few people who think they're right. There's a few people who think you're wrong. Um, and the consequences are really serious. Um, just grab my morning coffee. You know, the consequences are you can lose your job. You can destroy your career. You can be ostracized by people who really care about you. Because you use the wrong pronoun, because you address somebody in the wrong way because you wore a stupid costume, because you tweeted something you shouldn't have five years ago. Um, and, you know, that that's a really high bar to um, meet as a human being. But the question is, even if you're right, what happens if the rules of right and wrong change over time? And what happens if those of you on this call are some of the primary drivers of changing our notion of what is right and wrong. So let me explain that in a couple of minutes. I started working on genomics in 1995, back in the dark ages, when you could read every single paper and it fit on my diagram table. And of course, you couldn't read every paper that's published every hour today. And so over the course of 90s through here, where are we? I, I think we're getting to understand gene code well enough that I'm reasonably certain in the next few decades, not next few years, we will be able to understand the gene code well enough that we will be able to remake almost every one of our body parts. And so folks like Tony Atala are now working on about 32 different organs. And in the measure that that happens, then we're going to begin treating our bodies a little bit like we treat our houses. We'll swap out the windows. We will change the stove, et cetera, et cetera. And the rate limiting step then becomes the brain. So the reason why I switched from genomics to brain research about six years ago and started learning a new language that reads like Chinese to me is because that's where I think the difference between 120, 130, and a very different lifespan exists. Because even if you regrew your brain and swapped it out, 
you, you still have to have the memories because otherwise it makes no sense in terms of longevity. And so I'm not going to be surprised if people are swapping out kidneys. I'm not going to be surprised if people are swapping out knees by the time my grandchildren are around. Um, I am going to be surprised that they're swapping out brains. And of course, that leads to a series of questions. You know, what happens when we start mapping brains? What happens when we begin to understand memories? What happens when we begin to erase memories, induce memories, swap memories? And, and that's where I think we're going to have a whole lot of debates over the next few decades. Um, and that's why, to me at least, it's very interesting to sit and watch the birth of optogenetics and watch the birth of expansion microscopy and a series of other things. What's interesting in the meantime is how fast we're changing stuff. So a company that I co-founded with a few nutcases um, basically was able to take this picture and swap out the gene code of a cell for an entirely different gene code. And we call this Cynthia um, as a synthetic organism because we were able to insert a different gene code. And so the consequence of this thing, which was the science discovery of the year, is that you can now make cells programmable in the same way as you make computer chips programmable. And if you can make computer chips programmable and if you can make cells programmable, then you begin to develop platforms for the development of synthetic living machines. And again, that reaches the question of right and wrong. And what is right, what is wrong, for what use, by whom. And as you're thinking about creating these platforms for synthetic living machines, one of the things we started doing is to try and standardize the process. So we created an offshoot that um, basically looks like a desktop printer that allows you to print various synthetic living machines. And that has now IPO'd as Codex. And so we are building and shipping these machines. And so we've moved from, can you take all the gene code out of a cell, insert new gene code, reboot it, have it execute a different program to standardized machines that begin to spit this stuff out. Now, are these perfect? Nope. Are they sometimes awkward to use? Yep, just like the first gene sequencing machines. But you are beginning to get scalable pipelines for designing reconfigurable organisms. And in what I hear is a, a uh, official science term, that's a BFD. I mean, this, this is something that is going to change how things are made, where they're made, how they're structured. Um, and this is coming fast and people aren't really aware of this stuff. And so you go to the Wies Institute at Harvard and you've got people doing some experiments that are interesting. This is an old experiment, um, but it's combining rat hearts, rubber and gold into something that moves like a skate that may or may not be alive. Um, depends entirely on what your definition is. We are also approaching the basics of life from very different points of view. The Origins of Life initiatives that Dimitar Saslov and Jack Shostak are running are really interesting things, right? Because they are trying to build life from scratch. And if they are able to create life from scratch using instruments that were only available a billion years ago, which is a small constraint they put on their graduate students, um, that's going to have some interesting implications for where life comes from, how life is thought about, et cetera. So the point of this thing is what we can do changes not just the science, it changes our notions of right and wrong, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And to me, the fascinating thing is how absolutely, um, adaptable human beings are to the most outrageous scenarios. And all of you have already adapted in really interesting ways to something that your grandfather and grandmother would consider absolutely wrong and outrageous. And let me give you an example of that. Let's talk to grandma and grandma about the birds and the bees. And if we were talking to grandpa and grandma about the birds and the bees, imagine you have a time machine, you bring them back to your kitchen table, 
you're sitting there, you've had a little bit of wine, you're talking about birds and bees, you've brought them back in the time machine so they're randy 21 year olds, they're no longer venerable 60 year olds. And what's that conversation gonna look like? Well, imagine telling your grandpa, grandma, you know, we can now have sex all the time and never have a child. And yeah, they'd heard about birth control, but birth control was not legal for people who weren't married. Birth control was frowned upon for people who were married. Birth control was not effective over a long period of time. And now all of a sudden you can have all the sex you want and not have a child. And that would seem very weird to them. But then you'd have a chat with them and you'd say, oh, and by the way, um, I'm going to be teaching in Europe for the semester. And uh, my husband and I are going to have a child. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, you no longer need to be in the same room or have physical contact to have a child. And, and of course, we think of IVF as something normal and natural. But to them, that would have been a miracle called the Immaculate Conception. And the notion that two bodies never have to touch each other to conceive a child would have been absolutely alien. And as you move that forward, then you tell them, oh, by the way, I've decided to wait, so I'm going to freeze my eggs. And I'm going to have identical twins born to surrogate mothers 10 years apart. No change in today's technology. But these three things have separated act from consequence. Conception from physical contact and birth from time. And we think that is normal and natural, but had you asked your venerable old grandparents, do you think this is okay? They would have said, hell no. This is against the creator's will. This is against ethics. This is against, this stands against everything that we believe. And so we think about this stuff and, you know, we've adapted to it. And we've changed our notion of what's right and wrong 180 degrees, most of us, on this topic. Now try the same thought experiment. Now imagine that you take yourself and you are teleported into your grandkids' kitchen. They are 60 years old. And they're going to tell you about the birds of the bees with the technologies that all of you are inventing. Do you think that conception and sex is going to look anything like what it looks like today? Do you think you would think that a lot of things that they will take as normal and natural, you're just going to say, oh, sure, of course. Well, let's explore that a little bit. There was a justifiable scandal over a Chinese doctor editing babies. No SAB, no warning, no safety protocols, not really informed consent, et cetera. All right. Absolutely should be condemned. And, you know, lab shut down. I'm not sure if the guy should have gone to jail, but he didn't. And as you're looking at this, this headline could look very different to your kids. Because as this technology for gene editing embryos or babies gets faster, better, cheaper, then one of the things that might happen is you could see a discussion in 40 or 50 years my parents were so backward, so superstitious, so unscientific that I now have cancer because they didn't bother to edit out a KRAS or a P53 or a BRAC. And it will flip 180 degrees from, you know, how dare you do this to why didn't you do this as the technology moves faster, better, cheaper. And you're going to see this in various shapes and flavors. The first synthetic womb, 1955, right? And you're looking at a 1955 model. Of course, to my knowledge, no human being has been born in a synthetic womb so far. But you are beginning to get animals that are brought to term in what look like giant Ziploc bags. And as that moves forward, one thing that happens is you get absolutely great tabloid headlines in Britain where seeing this picture, they said, you, E-W-E, get a womb, W-O-M-B, very creative. Um, but as you're looking at the stuff, it's not 
impossible that someday it will be a human being in there and not a you. And if that happens, I think a lot of us would feel very uncomfortable with seeing that picture. But that may be a picture that your grandkids take for granted. Of course we did this instead of putting the child in the neonatal ICU. Of course we did this because it's a lot easier to edit spina bifida or it's a lot easier to check for genes or to edit you. And stuff that seems yucky to us, wrong to us, may flip 180 degrees in a generation. So the point of this thing is, in this era of tremendous certainty and anger and fury, even if you are right today, you may be wrong tomorrow. And so you have to be a little bit more modest in how you treat other people because when you judge founding fathers, when you judge previous science, when you judge uh, whether they should have had informed consent taking a cell line, you're judging in a context which is a different context. And that doesn't mean what they did back then was right. But it does mean that we have come forward in our conception of what is right. And unless if we want to be judged really harshly, it is really important to put a little bit more care, modesty, and stuff into this. Because people think of ethics as eternal, pristine, never changing, a little white marble statue. But here's the reality of the stuff. You are changing our notions of right and wrong with what you do in your labs every day. And you're pushing the boundaries of what we think is right and wrong as you work every day. So here's the bottom line. There are many things that change ethics. Religion can change ethics. Government can change ethics. Laws can change ethics. Societal mores, culture, a whole bunch of stuff shift our notion of right and wrong over time. But I would argue the biggest single driver of shifting what we think is right and wrong today is actually technology. I think technology fundamentally changes ethics. Technology is exponential. And ethics may begin to change at exponential rates. So you don't often think when I do this experiment, I may change our notion of what we think is okay or not okay as a society. But Right and wrong actually really does change over time. The pictures that follow are somewhat graphic. If you are bothered by these kinds of pictures, please just turn off the images. But it used to be normal and natural to do human sacrifice. In fact, it was legal, expected, and essential for the survival of the state and the society. Because if you did not sacrifice a whole bunch of people and rip out their hearts with obsidian knives, the sun wouldn't come up. The rains wouldn't come. Right? So the core of the society, the law of the society is you have to perform these savage acts in order for the society to survive. And we look at that today and we say, boy, who were these savages? So fast forward a few centuries, and it used to be normal and natural to burn heretics in town squares or to torture them in extreme ways before you kill them. You don't agree with my religion, I'll burn you. And that took place in Salem and it took place in Mayolid and it took place all over the world. And it was considered normal, natural, legal and part of the normal order of things to take people who did not believe in your religion or were slightly deviant from your religion, heretics, and just kill them with extreme pain. And again, we look at that and say, who the hell were these people? So fast forward that a few centuries and go to the fanciest squares in Paris where they had more modern methods of execution, more humane methods of execution. And there they'd simply cut off people's heads and they would show the heads to people and people would dress up in their finest and it would be like a carnival and they'd go celebrate somebody getting their head chopped up. Some societies still do that today. But in general, we look at this and we say, who the hell are these people? And why did they think this was okay? Why was this legal and accepted by the state? 
So here's the point. We can do really extraordinarily evil things and not realize at the time how evil they are. And again, let me emphasize, I am not justifying any of these acts. I'm simply saying they were a part of the acceptable legal right order of things as conceived of as the time. So to enter more controversial topics, we are having a big debate about slavery. And there is nobody on this call that thinks that indenturing or enslaving other human beings is right, period, full stop. It is simply wrong. So if all of us know that, then why was slavery a phenomenon, not just of the US South, but of Britain, of France, of India, of the Incas, of the Mayas, of the Chinese, of the Indians, of the Africans? Why did every civilization for millennia allow the enslavement of people, even though each person on this call knows that is absolutely heinous, undefensible behavior. If we know it, why didn't they know it? And why didn't they act? Certainly there were some very brave abolitionists, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Harriet Ward Beecher, a whole bunch of people put their lives on the line. But you know what? There were also abolitionists speaking out in the 1700s. And there were abolitionists speaking out in the 1600s. And many of them lost their lives. So why did slavery go away in legal terms? I understand there's still slavery today. But why did slavery go away in legal terms in most countries in a short period of time? Is it a complete coincidence that when you started using energy and machines, slavery began to go away in legal terms? Because a single barrel of oil contains about five to 10 years of human labor and machines produce thousands of horsepower. And guess what? It was the areas that were most industrialized that tended to abolish slavery first. And as the areas of the world that are least industrialized today where slavery is still highly prevalent. And so when you tie energy to thousands of horsepower, then you don't need to have things like this to transport people and go to war. You no longer need to take hundreds of people, manacle them to the oars, beat a drum to move your war machine. When you look at the amount of people driving that thing, think of what it would take to fly somebody or get somebody from Portland to San Francisco using that method. You can actually quantify it. It takes two of these. So in essence, what you've got when you go from Portland to San Francisco is you've got 320,000 people equivalent rowing you across the country. And how did people react to this change? Well, there were some absolute abuses at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and some of the mills that you see in Maine. There were children working, there were people dying on the job, there was pollution, it was dangerous, et cetera. But across the world, what you saw is a massive increase in average lifespan, despite the fact that parts of the Industrial Revolution were very cruel to a lot of people. What you actually got is after millennia, where your average lifespan was 20 to 30 years, average lifespan exploded in the Americas, in Europe, in Asia, in Africa. And so did average wealth. So what technology enabled you to do is not treat your fellow humans as cruelly, increase their average lifespan, increase their average wealth. It didn't do so evenly. It didn't do so across all countries. It didn't do so perfectly. It caused a lot of pain, but on average, that technological change made a past practice absolutely heinously wrong, outlawed that past practice, increased lifespan and increased average wealth on a massive scale. We can maintain our lifestyle and not have to be as cruel to others. 
I am not justifying slavery in any way, shape, or form. It is absolutely the wrong thing to do. It has always been the wrong thing to do. I'm asking the question, why after millennia did it start to go away in legal terms? And as you're thinking about these kinds of technologies, what happens when you start getting exponential technology curves? So think, for instance, of what's happened with the ability to communicate. If you are trying to take over a state, a country, you, traditionally you have three targets. You go and you take over the presidential palace, you take over the army headquarters, and you take over the TV and radio stations. What happens when technology enables decentralized broadcasting on a global basis? Well, then what is okay today begins to be wrong tomorrow. And you can see that happening very quickly with topics like gay marriage. Because in 1997, two thirds of the United States was against this. And today, two thirds are for. Almost a 180 degree flip in the majority opinion. Really interesting changes in things that some people would say these are fundamental beliefs, sometimes backed very strongly by religions that have been taught for a long time. And yet, in 20 years, you get a 180 degree flip in the majority opinion. And a great deal of this has to do with broadcast technology, with radio, with television, with theater, with people coming together in universities and various places. really interesting change in a fundamental question. So that's the past. How about the future? Could we possibly be doing stuff today? Us, righteous us, we who know the answers to right and wrong. Could we possibly be doing something that might be seen as particularly awful in the future? And might technology change that? Well, you look at this picture, and this picture could be a very controversial picture. Right, political barbecue. Of course, it's not the political barbecue you're thinking of because this is in Canada. So the people wearing red are actually supporting a liberal Justin Trudeau. So that's not the controversial part of this picture, or maybe it is. The controversial part is they're grilling. And when you take a synthetic burger that costs 380,000 bucks in 2013, 30 bucks in 2015, Nine bucks is 2020, and now what, three bucks at Whole Foods in Portland? Then you begin to get what people are calling cruelty free beef. Then you don't have to grow a creature for three years and slaughter it. Then you don't have to slaughter six billion animals a year. And as you have a faster, better, cheaper alternative, it may be that these pictures of grandpa and grandma walking into a fancy steakhouse in the fanciest, most expensive restaurant may look a little different to our grandkids. They may not appreciate this picture as much as some of us do. Oh, yum, dinner served. Yeah, that might look a little different in a generation or two. It's already starting to look different to many in the current generation. So how does this impact you and why should you care? Well, business and science are seen as ethical and competent today. Not by everybody. There's a whole lot of pushback against science. There's a whole lot of pushback against business. But there's been a real shift in who is seen as ethical and competent. And government ain't leading. So what you are starting to see is you're starting to see scientists and CEOs get into a societal debate they normally haven't been in, where scientists and CEOs are being asked to step in when government doesn't fix societal problems. Why don't you folks fix it? To take the lead on social change instead of waiting for government to impose change. To be accountable to the public. And like or not, it's not just business, science is right in the middle of this. You can't just be a lab director and think, oh, it doesn't matter what I'm doing, society is not going to hold me accountable directly for societal change. 
And questions were never asked, like, what is this going to do in income distribution? Are questions that some of you may be getting today. Brands and reputations can be made in one day by one action and by people's reaction to that one action. So as you're thinking about this stuff, <clears throat> maybe the greatest question about right and wrong is what are we going to do with this power? Because we are the only species that so far has the ability to directly and deliberately alter the course of evolution. We have taken Darwin's rules of natural selection, random mutation, and we flip them 180 degrees. Because when you do wheat fields, when you do your garden, when you do aquaculture, when you plant a forest or cut a forest, you are determining what lives and dies, and human beings are now determining what lives and dies on about half the surface of the planet. And that has nothing to do with natural selection. That's got to do with human selection. Humans choose this to live or to die. Leave that space fallow. You'll see natural selection. We're not leaving a lot of spaces fallow. And then, of course, the stuff that all of you do every day in your lab with gene editing, with you know, clones, with vectors, with this, that, or the other, that's got nothing to do with random mutation. That's got to do very clearly with directed evolution. I want to alter this cell to make this medicine. I want to alter this cell to make this kind of yogurt. I want to alter this cell to make this kind of vaccine. That is not random mutation, folks. That is directed evolution. So you've taken the logic of evolution and you've flipped it 180 degrees to our choices. We're also changing the nature of things like energy. So when you see cost curves that look like this on solar, sooner or later, this is going to cross the price of coal. And then it's going to cross the price of oil. And then it's going to cost, cross the price of gas. Every time it crosses one of those things, it becomes less and less logical in economic terms to use coal, to use oil. And it's easier to condemn those who did. Because you have a faster, better, cheaper alternative. And then how dare these savages have burned coal in the same way as how dare these savages have burned whale oil. So we are going to see some real shifts in what we think is okay in terms of energy usage, storage, production, pollution. That leads me in conclusion to arguing that when we judge the past, when we judge each other, it is really important to bring back two words that are very rarely used today, which are humility and forgiveness. We are in the mood to condemn a lot of people. And we're spending $2 billion or more every electoral cycle convincing 51% of the people that they never, ever, ever want to associate with those other people over there. Those are the others. Those people are evil. Those people steal babies. Those people kill babies. Those people uh, teach their babies savage things. Those people you know, or fascist, whatever label you want to use on whatever side you're talking about. But here's the reality. If you're driving across Maine, your car breaks down in a snowstorm, you go knock on a door. 98% or 99% of people will open the door and will try and help you. They will either try and help you with your car or they will help you get a tow truck. And likely as not, they will feed you dinner. And they may be of a very different political persuasion. They may be of a very different ethnicity, whatever you want. But most people are decent. And because we are in this judgmental period of right and wrong, and we are right, and we never want to talk to those people over there, we can rip ourselves, our communities in this country apart. Because we are so right, and therefore we can do a lot of things that are absolutely unjustifiable to the other. One of the big lessons of World War II is it's a really bad idea to take Japanese family and put them in concentration camps. And that's taught everywhere today. What's astonishing to me is knowing that lesson, 
how in the past few years did we not only take the families who came across without papers, but we took the children, separated them from the families and deliberately lost those children. Even in World War II, you did not separate the Japanese American families. But here, for some reason, as a society, we thought, hey, it's perfectly fine not only to capture these folks, put them in these camps, but to separate and lose the children. That is stuff that the South American juntas used to do. Those are crimes against humanity. And for some reason, a lot of us tolerate that. When you separate right and wrong and you have tribes, then you enter a period of Voltaire where those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities because you're doing it to the other. And therefore, it's okay to call the other X, Y, or Z and to forget their humanity. And I'm, I'm not picking on one side or two sides or three sides. When you think you know right from wrong, there is no discussion, no tolerance, no evolution, no learning. There's no middle ground. It's my way or the highway, and you either agree with everything that the extremes of my side are advocating, or you're a traitor and should be shot. And that's a very dangerous place to sit. There's a lot of opportunities in science. There's a lot of stuff coming in science. But science is not alien to the right-wrong debate. Because technology is exponential, because technology changes ethics, and because ethics may change at exponential rates, there are many opportunities and there are many places to think carefully about how to bring your fellow human beings along to your changing notion of right and wrong and how to see the humanity in those who haven't seen it yet, what is obvious to you. And then the other thing you got to do is you do have to isolate the 1% on the extremes that is evil because there is a 1% at the extremes that's evil and that pushes their side to accept things that are evil. And that's a very dangerous situation for a nation. So I'm going to stop there and see if you have any questions, rebuttals, accusations, whatever you wish. They don't have to be questions. They can be comments or anything you wish. Thank you so much, Juan. Um, I think everybody who is here today, I think everybody's mind is blown right now. And I don't think anybody will go about their day in an ordinary fashion after this talk. We do have some questions. Um, I'm going to probably won't be able to do all of them, but we'll start with one from Christy Townsend. Um, a compelling and relevant talk for all of us. Thank you. Wondering about your thoughts about who decides what is right and wrong as technology evolves over time. What regulatory bodies should be in place? How should they function and yet remain flexible and open-minded to changes in norms? For example, as human gene editing moves ahead. So I think as long as scientists, not all scientists, but most scientists are aware that these dilemmas are sitting there, as long as entrepreneurs are aware that these dilemmas are sitting there, there tends to be a pretty good regulatory body, right? So once you realize that these Chinese babies had been edited, there was a violent reaction to it. And, and it was a reaction first by the scientific community, not by the legal authorities. Scientists, as long as they realize there's a dilemma, like what was presented of Silomar on gene editing, tend to iterate towards a peer-reviewed process that may take much longer than we want, may not be right to begin with, but eventually gets to the right solution. And, and I think what's really important in that is when you judge your, you know, your peers who didn't do full informed consent on samples, boy, there for the grace of God go I, because those weren't the norms. And, and I think it's brutal to take Laura Ingalls Waller's name off one of the most prestigious library prizes in the US. Because when she wrote Little House on the Prairie, the perception, the words, the 
the societal debate was a very different societal debate. And I get much more upset about people who show extreme forms of racism, discrimination today than I do by a 16 year old in Charleston, South Carolina in 1840. And I'm not arguing that what that teenager was doing was right in any way, shape or form. I'm simply arguing there for the grace of God go I and humility and forgiveness of would I have done that if educated there is a really important question because it's very easy to condemn from here. But here's the deal. Social media is an electronic tattoo. And it doesn't go away when you're buried. Right? Your Twitter account, your Facebook account, your emails, your bank accounts, your credit card statements will tell you a whole lot from the digital exhaust about who you were, what you cared for. Huh, look at grandma's dating profile. I didn't know grandma was into that. That costs 0. 0.0003 cents per dating profile. And the costs are dropping. So judging each other and how we judge each other and how we treat each other and how we self-regulate as the rules change is a really important question and it ain't gonna come out of Congress until very much later. It ain't gonna come out of local authorities until very much later. Which is not to say that local authorities don't try. Al Vecchio, who was trying to ban genetic engineering in the city of Cambridge, and fortunately he wasn't successful, was a very quirky guy. He also got very upset at the Harvard Lampoon making fun of him. So he passed a city ordinance declaring the National Lampoon Building an official Cambridge urinal. Um, strange things happen when you get local authorities and national authorities legislating ahead of those who know a subject. Well, thank you so much for this answer. Um, lots of interesting information there. We don't have too much time, but so many questions. I think, uh, you know, this talk was very thought provoking. I'm going to ask one that's big from Jose Robledo. And the question is, do you envision even not to need a body? So one of the most interesting experiments that I think can be done today is to take two mice and swap the heads. And you're now getting to the point where you can restitch the spinal cords well enough that you can see how that experiment could be done someday. And why is that such an interesting experiment? Because when they did the first heart transplants, they actually brought in the wife and daughter of the donor in a couple of instances and said, do you feel anything? Well, no, who are these people? But for thousands of years, I gave her my heart, she took my heart, she broke my heart. So we thought that the heart contained emotion and that if we transplanted the heart, we would transplant emotions and love and feelings. Well, no, it turns out to be a muscle. So why is the mouse experiment so interesting? Because if you swap Mickey and Minnie Mouse's brains, does the new mouse remember what it fears? Does it remember it loves the other mouse? Does it remember the pattern through the maze? And if you find that you can tr successfully transplant a brain from one body to another, then you begin to answer the first part of your question, which is, huh, it turns out that you can transplant these memories onto a different body. And if you can do that, then the question becomes, is the only input output system for these memories a body? But we're a long way from answering that. We're not that long away from answering the question, what happens when you put brains and memory on a different body? And as you're looking at neural networks and AI modeling, then you begin to get into really weird questions, which are science fiction questions. They're not science questions yet. But if you can model the brain as a series of electro pulses, do you need the chemical reactions as well as the electric pulses? And can you store memories through electric pulses with no chemicals? And can you 
alter those electric pulses to induce or change or do other stuff with memory. And the consequence to answering your question in the affirmative, which is, do you really need a body to hold consciousness and memory? We're centuries away from answering that. But the consequence is it would probably enable large scale galactic travel. Because you would have a non carbon based body with a memory and a consciousness that wouldn't need, you know, 1400 calories per day and radiation shielding and wouldn't have a limited lifespan. So if we ever want to explore the galaxy at scale, you would have to do something like that in a silicon based organism, not a carbon based organism. But again, this is a realm of science fiction. This is not the realm of science. It's an interesting question. The first baby steps are gonna be taken with the first head transplants, which by the way, I'm not advocating. There's an Italian guy out there who's trying to do it with humans, bad idea. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, on that interesting note, <laughs> we're going to end. There are a lot of comments, lots of questions. Apologies to anybody whose question I couldn't um, ask, but I'm just trying to stay on schedule here. Juan, we're so appreciative. This was absolutely amazing. I can't stress that enough. And I also said welcome to Maine, but it sounds like you're already in Maine and you're pretty much a Mainer. So <laughs> thank you again um, for this very, very thought provoking morning. And so um, now I think we're going to go into a short break. Okay. So it is now 1020 um, and I wanted to introduce the moderator of our panel. The panel discussion starting now is called Navigating Life Science Business and Workforce in 2021. Um, and this panel is going to be moderated by Toby Ahrens, from, uh, Program Director from Focus Maine. Focus Maine is our partner organization. We couldn't be happier to work with you. I think you're doing great things. Um, and so Toby will introduce the panelists. Okay, great, thanks Agnieszka. I feel like we need to start with a therapy session or something after that, but we'll okay. go ahead and get started. So um, Toby Ahrens, Program Director for Focus Maine, and I'll be moderating this morning's panel, which is uh, Navigating Life Sciences, Businesses and Workforce in 2021, which actually covers two themes, uh, how this past year has influenced priorities at two of the larger life sciences uh, companies in Maine, Jackson IDEX, and for a quick spoiler alert, both organizations have had very positive momentum that, that should continue in the near future, um, which brings us to the second and very related portion of the conversation on workforce development, because it's impossible to talk about the potential for uh, growth without having a plan for finding and, and training that workforce. Uh, Juan had some very explicit examples of workforce development in a historical context, and I suspect it's going to be, uh, we're going to hear about some slightly different models from uh, Maine Community College System and Roop, and the great work they're trying to do with industry and individuals on models that are, are very different from the past. So uh, again, a tough act to follow, galactic travel and right and wrong, and uh, thank you very much, Juan, if you're still with us. Uh, a lot to think about, um, not just for the future of life sciences, but also of uh, ethics and, and how technology changes ethics. We also heard yesterday about uh, an incredible potential for, for Maine as the new horizon for life sciences, lots of discussion about early stage businesses and tech transfer in the state. But I think we shouldn't forget when we talk about all this you know, potential uh, in, in, in the future that there are some incredible organizations that are already here that have grown incredible businesses, have a global footprint. And so we'll get a, a chance to hear from them this morning. Um, before we jump into the panel, I just want to quickly thank uh, BioMaine and Maine Center for Entrepreneurs for, for hosting the event, both do incredible work connecting, convening, providing business support and mentorship in the life sciences, both are partners of ours at Focus Maine. Very quickly, Focus Maine is an initiative to grow good jobs in three sectors where we think Maine has uh, incredible promise, um, both for growth and continued leadership, uh, two in the food economy, ag and aquaculture, as well as the subject of the last couple of days in biosciences. So we've all done a lot of listening and thinking yesterday and this morning. So we'll try to get everyone involved. So please ask lots of questions, drop them in the chat box. No need to wait until the end. Um, and 
I've done enough talking now. So before we dive into questions, I'm going to ask each of the panelists if we can just do a quick round of introductions. I'll ask you to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your organization. And um, just for the purposes of the, the panel and the audience, I think it'd be nice uh, if folks can hear any formal ways that you're working with some of the other uh, panelists on the call. So um, with that, why don't we start off with um, Katie Longley, so Executive Vice President of, uh, of Jackson Labs, also Chief Operating Officer. So um, Katie, over to you for introduction. Thanks, Toby, and good morning, everybody. Uh, that was an incredible talk, and I feel like we have to come down to earth now and talk about practical issues. Um, so yes, I'm Katie Longley. I'm the Chief Operating Officer and Executive Vice President at the Jackson Laboratory, and I've been here for about a little over five years now. Um, I think we all have problems with time uh, after COVID. It's, it's almost like we have a lost year there and can't remember. I don't know if any of you have this issue, but I can't remember if things took place in 2019 or 2020. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about uh, the Jackson Laboratory. For those of you who are not familiar with us, um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit headquartered in Maine, uh, devoted to research and curing human disease. And that is a lofty aspiration. We have about 2,500 employees. And we just recently added another 250 employees with, through an acquisition in Japan. Uh, we are located in Maine, Connecticut, Sacramento, Beijing and Shanghai, China, and now uh, three locations in Japan. Uh, our workforce, which is the subject of today's talk, uh, runs the gamut. From mouse production workers, we, we produce, as many of you know, world-class mouse models used in the life sciences, shipped around the world, and they're bred and sold from Maine and other locations. So we have frontline animal care workers all the way up to PhD scientists. What many people don't know is we have 70 research faculty who are studying genomics and genetics and disease in all the major disease areas, cancer, neurology, um, aging, dementia, and rare disease. So um, from a workforce standpoint, uh, we, we are hiring people from all walks of life. Um, so I think that's a good introduction and I'm happy to join this panel. We are working actively with the Rue Institute and the Maine Community College System and the Maine Community College System in upskilling and degree completion and the Rue Institute for interns and um, many of our scientific projects. So I'll stop there. Yeah, great, perfect. And we'll certainly have time to get into some of those programs uh, this morning. Um, thanks, uh, Julie Cross, uh, Senior Research and Development Manager at IDEX. Um, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I've been with IDEX about um, 10 years now. I've had a couple different roles um, in product support, uh, research and development, and now um, in operations now and focused on uh, transferring products out of research and development from new product development um, into um, operations. And um, so at IDEX, uh, it was founded in, I believe, 1983. It's headquartered in Maine, actually in, um, in Westbrook, which is where I am now. I'm in our newest building, which is lovely. It's not even a fake background. <laughs> so nice. Um, we develop, manufacture, and distribute um, products and provide services uh, primarily for the uh, veterinary, um, livestock, poultry, dairy, and water um, testing markets. We also do um, provide a few um, point of care and laboratory diagnostics products um, for the human market. Um, in the last year, we did um, develop a uh, PCR test um, for um, the coronavirus in humans. So that's our our latest um, human um, test, but we did have a few um, even before the pandemic. Um, primarily, we have um, we we produce test kits. I'd say as our, our largest um, product, but also laboratory services. Veterinarians um, can send in samples to our worldwide reference network, uh, reference lab network. So we have almost a hundred um, locations throughout the globe. Um, some of them are research and development, some production, and some are these um, reference laboratories um, that prim primarily um, assay samples and return results to the submitting veterinarian. Um, we also manufacture instruments, and we actually do that here on site in Westbrook as well. Um, a couple different kinds, um, some um, immunoassay instruments, some flow cytometry, um, 
type equipment. And we also produce um, quite a bit of software. Uh, some of it is for our own purposes, for the instruments, things like that, but also veterinary practice management, um, which given <laughs> how much the veterinary practice has changed over the last year, um, that's been a very exciting um, growth opportunity for us as well. Um, one thing that um, I didn't know until um, actually just a few years ago, I'd been here a while, um, is we do um, provide the largest investment in R&D in veterinary diagnostics of any company. So we put quite a lot of um, money back into um, specifically uh, veterinary diagnostics. Um, we're organized into kind of three business segments. We have the companion animal group, which is primarily where I work. Um, we also have, as I mentioned, the water testing um, group uh, to basically determine um, water quality and safety for drinking water for municipalities um, around the globe, but um, with quite a bit, bit of our business is in North America. And then we have a livestock, poultry, and dairy business um, to test things like um, vaccine titers and flocks, also um, presence um, or hopefully absence of um, uh, growth hormones and things like that in a milk supply. So it's quite uh, diverse business, but the technology underlying it, um, there's a lot, a lot of similarities across all of that. Um, our annual revenue is about 3 billion now, almost 3 billion. So it's doubled in the 10 years I've been here. So we're experiencing huge growth, uh, which is lovely, but also challenging. We can get into that. And um, I believe we have now close to 9,000 employees um, worldwide. I think that's about it. Oh, um, we are partnering with um, quite a few other organizations throughout Maine. I know we have a pretty robust intern and co-op program with uh, RU and also UMaine, um, as well as um, other universities. And I think we're always looking uh, for additional ways to partner with um, um, other community organizations and um, colleges and universities around Maine. Great. That's okay. it. Yeah, thanks, Noah. Partnership, I think, will certainly be a theme of this morning's panel. Hard to hard to go it alone. So I, um, yeah, yes. I'm curious to hear hear more about that. Um, Dan Bellier, Chief Workforce Development Officer for the Maine Community College System. Over to you. Great. Well, good morning, and it's um, an honor to be on this panel with uh, these distinguished folks here. And and I caught the last part of um, the discussion and. And that I, I wish I would have gotten all of it because it was certainly very interesting. Um, but it's good to be here this morning. Um, I am the Chief Workforce Development Officer for the Maine Community College System. Uh, I've been with Community College System just over 33 years. Um, most of that time was spent at um, one of our local community colleges, um, 28 years at Eastern Maine Community College um, in all sorts of areas. So. Um, one of the one of the things that um, I have the pleasure of being part of is the um, workforce efforts um, with our seven campus partners across the state of Maine. We do have um, some great relationships with um, Jackson Lab um, over the years, um, and I know one of our companion campuses, Southern Maine Community College, has been has done some work with IDEX, and we've been in strong conversations um, with the Rue Institute. Um, on, on collaborations and things that we can do. Um, my primary role in, in what we're doing around Maine's workforce is that what we call short-term training. And the short-term training is, is training that um, can be uh, a year or less. So it could be a day or two or six weeks, 12 weeks, up to a year. And that's where um, one of our most recent focuses um, is currently happening. Um, with the new investments from the Harold Alphon Foundation and the Maine Jobs and Recovery Act. Um, our, our platform is um, training 16,000 folks in certificate and degree programs at our community colleges. And that is working um, quite well. Um, our focus areas in, in credential attainment and in workforce are healthcare, the green economy, trades, manufacturing, hospitality, education um, and computer technology. And um, what we're doing on, on our side is working on those pathways, um, very transparent and guided pathways from short-term training um, to our degree programs. And I think um, I'll be able to jump into more detail on, on our efforts over the next four years to train 24,000 main learners in up, uh, upgrading um, their skills. And, and as, as we all know, there's 
there's significant opportunities and challenges. And um, one of the opportunities that I see is we have 186 Mainers with some college, no degree. And how do we engage them through partnerships and how do we engage our business partners and work together um, to help Maine succeed, help Maine learners succeed and help Maine businesses succeed. And I'm happy to dive a little deeper as, as we work our way through this morning session. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah, we heard this morning from Agnieszka about these great programs in the high schools and inspiring young students and letting them inspire us about careers in the life sciences. But I, you know, there's an enormous amount of interest even beyond that later in, in life. And for somebody that you know, thinks maybe the trades might be accessible, but the STEM fields and the life science is less accessible. I think you have some incredible programs for on-ramping folks at any age and stage into the life sciences. And there's certainly a, a really broad spectrum of roles to, to bring in uh, different folks. So I, yeah, looking forward to hear more about that. Um, last but not least, um, Eileen Huang Saad, Director of the Life Sciences and Engineering Programs at the Ruby Institute. Over to you, Eileen. Great. Thanks so much for having me. It's really exciting to be um, part of such a strong panel. Um, I love meeting everyone in the community. I'm sorry that uh, we haven't been able to have as many in-person events uh, as I know you all typically do, but um, what a welcoming group. Uh, as he said, my name is Eileen Huang Saad. I'm the Director of Life Sciences and Engineering, as well as Associate Professor of Bioengineering at Northeastern U University at the Ru Institute. Um, as many of you probably know, our, uh, the Ru Institute is a new regional campus that is located here in Portland, Maine, and we are part of the global university system that Northeastern has been developing and evolving over the last several years. Um, the key about the, the regional campuses and, and Northeastern's North Star is that we're really attempting to grow into what we call a global university, a university that can reach students across the world and give them access to educational opportunities as well as research opportunities for what we call lifelong learning. Because we recognize the fact that education is drastically changing, technology changes very frequently, and we need to be able to give people access to the, um, the information and skill sets as technology evolves. We cannot depend necessarily on one degree uh, at an early stage in your career for long-term success. Um, the other unique thing about the Rue Institute is the fact that we are committed to playing a critical role with everyone else in the state of Maine to impact the state of Maine's economy. And so we're very excited to be part of such a vibrant community that clearly has been working together and has great insights into where Maine should go in terms of the life sciences and technology. We have both education and research at our institution, and the research component is actually rather unique for most of the regional campuses at, at um, Northeastern. The three educational focuses that we have are computer science, the second is continuing professional education, and the third is life sciences and engineering. On the research side, we've been developing expertise with our new director of engineering, Jack Glesko, precision medicine with Ray Winslow, as well as data visualization with Melanie Torrey. Um, so we, the students that interact at the RU will have a really unique opportunity to do, bo do both educational programs, but also interact with our research um, team. So we offer everything from uh, master's programs, certificates, as well as biz to bi business to business opportunities with the sole, um, in terms of education, we think very clearly in terms of attracting promoting and retaining talent, right? So um, as we've all read a lot of the economic development work out of the state of Maine, we have a lot of work in ter terms of trying to move the workforce, not only just in promoting and retaining our talent, but attracting new talent to the state. Um, the other unique aspect about Northeastern's RU Institute is the fact that really we really put partnership and promoting entrepreneurship and experiential learning at the forefront of what we do. All of the students that participate in our programs uh, are either required or have the opportunity to do co-op programs, which many of you have um, referenced and are leveraging. And we're really trying to bridge the gap between education and professional practice. So we've been working hard to connect with all of the great organizations of the state, because what we hope to do is to help amplify the talent of the state. I think at the beginning at the conversation when Agnieszka was asking people for things that we need to do um, to help promote the life sciences here, one of which was really, um, 
sharing the great talents of Maine with the rest of the, the, the world. And so we've partnered to make sure that we have an opportunity to bring all the great talents uh, and amplify that of the great work. So I'm happy to say we've been working with IDEX and JAX uh, in terms of doing co-ops as well as having B2B types of uh, educational programs. To name a few, we've been working with SMCC to try and bridge the associates to master's pathway, as well as we have created a number of four plus ones with the universities across the state. Because our goal is to work collaboratively with everyone in the state so that we can all work to make a better um, opportunities for our community. So thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks, Eileen. So at, at Focus Maine, we do a lot of outreach to Boston-based companies and companies based elsewhere that are thinking of moving to Maine. And one of the first questions that always comes up is, you know, tell me about workforce. What's the trained workforce like like in Maine? What are the training programs? And um, so this is this is all really great. And I know that we're going to get into more detail on um, some you know, growth opportunities, both at IDEX and JAX, and how both your organizations are working with them to address those and, and other groups as well. So um, I'd like to start out with uh, a question, both for, for Katie and Julie. As I mentioned earlier, and uh, you know, yesterday and this morning, we're talking a lot about future potential, but both of you have leadership roles at, at organizations that, as we just heard, um, are have grown here and are growing. Um, and I'd be curious to hear your perspectives as two of the largest employers in Maine. The COVID question, but uh, you know, how, how has COVID impacted your growth trajectory? But I'd like it to be you know, a forward-looking response. And you know, we know the last year has impacted everyone's business. And starting with you, Julie, you just had mentioned, you know, IDEX got into human diagnostics. Certainly the companion animal world has exploded. Uh, this past year. So maybe just talk a little bit about, um, yeah, we, from a growth trajectory forward looking uh, perspective, uh, what is this this last year? Um, how has it influenced the organization? Sure. Um, I can't like see everyone's uh, face, but, you know, just thinking about how many people um, on this uh, Zoom got pandemic puppies or no people that did, right? It was probably quite a few of us. Um, so that's definitely um, impacted our business. Um, but to like back up um, just a second, uh, you know, initially, I think at the, the beginning of things, sort of in the um, end of first quarter, beginning of second quarter in 2020, um, you know, our, our business did decline quite a bit. And then we entered um, a phase of uncertainty. You know, we saw things bounce back pretty quickly, um, but but there was just a lot of uncertainty, which was not something um, that we'd really experienced before. You know, I think we had a, a pretty certain plan for growth and, and that kind of thing. And, um, and it, you know, it just required rethinking, uh, you know, some strategies and that kind of thing. So it, it was just, you know, it just changed a lot of things um, about, about our plans. Um, but then I think it's the sort of pandemic puppy thing, you know, hit and, 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 you know, you could think about that, but then also the veterinarians um, themselves, you know, a lot of our products go to veterinarians. And for those of you that have pets, you know, maybe you've noticed it takes a little longer to get an appointment or your appointment looks a little bit different now than it does. So um, it changed the way, um, you know, veterinarians are providing care in some ways, maybe they're more efficient. Um, you know, a lot of um, veterinarians are, are still not really seeing client, um, the human clients, you know, maybe they're just taking the, the pets. And so that does lend some efficiency, but, you know, there's, there's some downsides to that too. Um, the, I think the idea that people are staying home um, and working, a lot of people um, are, not everyone for sure, but, um, you know, you're around your pets more often. Maybe you notice, oh, you know, is, is my dog limping? Is my cat lethargic or something like that? So we've noticed even um, not just new pet adoptions, but um, with existing pets, they seem to be going more frequently and for uh, you know, maybe more like wellness type checks um, as well. So that has, again, changed our business. You think about the products we manufacture and the balance of, of different ones. So it's just, it's been constant change and adapting to that change, um, and, you know, and trying to make sure um, that we have what we need, um, you know, to support um, the veterinarians in, in what they do. Um, let's see, what else? Um, I think in another idea of sort of um, adapting and, and uncertainty, um, 
the supply chain uh, as you know, uh, my washer broke last year. You cannot just go out and buy another clothes washer um, and you know, expect it to be in your house on Tuesday. Um, so it's the same you know, with supplies and we share a lot of supplies with the um, uh, vaccine uh, manufacturing industry and then the human um, COVID tests, which are you know, just hugely ramped up um, right now. So we share a lot of the same things with that. So supply chain has been a challenge um, and you know, focusing on that um, has been uh, interesting again, so that we can support, um, you know, keeping pets, livestock, milk, water, you know, we, we you know, it tests more than just um, pet type animals, you know, as well, too. So um, that's been, it's been quite a challenge. <laughs> I don't know if I answered your question. Um, yeah, no, you certainly did. So how about the supply chain on workforce? Has that been okay? Do you have openings that are being unfilled? Yeah. What's, what's that look like? And we'll get into this. Yeah. Later. Yeah, definitely. Um, we do. We do have, um, again, this has been a change. It's just been constant change is the theme. Um, I think before um, the pandemic, as soon as we had an open position, we had many candidates, you know, that would apply. We didn't have a lot of openings. And, you know, I would hear from friends and acquaintances, oh, you know, I, I'd like to work at IDEX. Are there any openings, you know, and it's really shifted now. We have quite a few openings, um, some that have been open for months that, you know, we're really struggling to fill. Uh, many of them are, um, production um, uh, worker job, entry-level jobs um, that don't require a college degree. Um, and, but then also there are, you know, research and development, um, you know, principal, senior scientist, manager positions that we're also struggling to fill. Um, and uh, I think just at all levels, we've had to really um, change, uh, you know, what we do. It's no longer enough to just post, you know, a job online and, and wait for people to come to you. You know, we're really working on um, how we recruit um, and some incentives um, that we've had. Um, I don't know if we wanna get into this now, but particularly with our hourly employees, we've um, started a new program. It's called HEART. Um, it's an hourly employee. Um, I think it's advocacy, uh, recruitment and uh, training. And so it's, uh, there's a couple phases. We've just started a few months ago, but it basically involves you know, identifying um, folks that we already have um, and, and uh, here um, working for us and training them, um, thinking really about their development plan. We had quite a few people that were maybe uh, in production jobs that didn't require a college degree, but yet they had a college degree um, that they weren't using, it was underutilized. Um, and so really working with them on what a development path might look like so that, again, it helps us you know, fill some of these other roles um, that we have open as well too, and it retains you know, um, good employees. And so um, it sort of sets them up with a mentor and, and works through what it, what it might uh, mean. We've started um, a program here where there's, uh, you can advertise if you have a, a kind of a side project, it's called a gig and it's set up in our um, uh, HR system. And so, you know, if someone's looking for development opportunity um, or a way to use a degree that maybe they're not using in their job, they could um, pick a gig off this gig board. And then we actually do, um, pay the person so if like their you know, their job might be a production worker but they want to do something with software development and if there's a pay difference well you know pay them at the the higher rate for the time that they're working on the the gig work and i think that's just starting it's been really successful but just the idea of you know investing in our employees and offering things like that um, i think it's been really impactful and we're looking to grow that program but uh takes a little time. <laughs> that, that's really interesting. I've never heard about a, a program like that. And I think all of these, mm -hmm. you know, focusing as much on retention and having employees that feel fulfilled as, as important mm -hmm. now in the great resignation era as ever. Um, and to bring, exactly. yeah, to bring Katie into this, I know that Jax has been in the news for some really creative ways to address workforce challenges. Uh, maybe before we get to the workforce challenge issues, um, Katie, you mentioned the you know, expand you know, the recent acquisition of the Japanese firm. How are things looking at at Jax these days? And the same sort of COVID question for you know future future growth. I know that uh, I was on your website the other day uh, trying to get up to speed for the this this panel. Um, incredible number of of openings and and how much of that is from uh, you know loss of personnel or future growth. Uh, maybe over to you to talk about what the the near future looks like at Jax. Yeah, thanks, Toby. Um, and Julie, that gig uh, program sounds really great. We'll, we'll want to hear more about that. Uh, so let me just do the, you know, um, way back machine, talk about COVID and, and uh, not so way back. 
and what we've been doing and then be a little future um, facing. So in COVID, um, we never really closed. So we have most of our production officers, uh, production employees all have to work day in, day out. Uh, we did have most of our administrators go remote, um, but it was obviously a lesson like for all of us in an adaptation and resiliency, right? So what did we do? Within the first 60 days of the um, pandemic, we took our CLIA lab in, um, our CLIA cap lab in uh, Connecticut and stood up a COVID-19 testing site. We've done over a million and a half PCR tests. That was a great kind of a entrepreneurial um, exercise. We worked really quickly um, to have our diagnostic lab and that revenue helped offset the loss of revenue when universities, 50% of our customers are universities and academia. And of course, they, many of those labs were closed. So uh, we lost some sales in that area, but we were able to fill it with the, um, with the revenue from the testing. So that was, that was really a wonderful thing. The second thing was contributing to the COVID-19 um, disease research generally. So as many of you may know, Jax developed a humanized mouse. Mice um, in their um, uh, natural form are immune from COVID. But because we do genetic engineering, we engineered a human mouse that was that was um, uh, uh, that could catch COVID. And we produced that mouse colony in about 15 weeks. And by May of 2020, we were shipping those mice worldwide for, re for COVID vaccine research. So we were really pleased to be able to, to fill um, our mission of helping to cure disease and directly with COVID. I think those two programs, the testing that we were doing mostly for the state of Connecticut, also in Maine for Maine Maritime Academy and the University of Maine and others, and the um, production of a specific research mouse model for COVID-19 um, kept the organization really engaged and the employees engaged. And as we all know, engagement is such a big part of retention, right? Um, we didn't lose revenue. Uh, we were basically came out of, of the um, pandemic financially on solid ground. And for that, we're really um, thankful. We did, however, have supply chain issues uh, like the rest, rest of the world. Um, in our rooms, we have full PPE. So like the hospitals, we had PPE shortages. Um, and we had reagent shortages for our testing. So we had many of the people probably on this call, we were calling each other back and forth to see, you know, the university, do you have some reagents you could loan us? Um, uh, Narav Shah and people at the state of Maine CDC calling us. So um, wonderful thing is Maine is such a uh, tight community that we all helped each other out and, and gave each other uh, excess when we had it. Um, so I think I, I, I commented on some bright spots. And now we're headed back into more of a reintegration phase this fall where um, most of our administrators and scientific staff are back. Um, and uh, we also during the pandemic did employee testing on site, which was great because it made our employees feel really safe. Um, workforce, I don't know if you wanna do that now, Toby, or um, you, if you wanna switch to another question. Why don't you help me with the transition and bringing Eileen and Dan in, into the conversation? So I, I know you guys are doing a lot of really uh, creative things on workforce attraction, um, and certainly, you know, Dan and Eileen, it, it, it's it's no longer an era of you know someone goes to high school and then either community college or get some training and then they're off and running on their career. There are lots of different on ramps and. You know, before we get into some of that programming, I think, you know, even just from an attraction standpoint, once somebody is trained and they've made their way to the Jack's website and they're considering it, there are different things that you're doing to try to seal the deal. So, um, yeah, why don't you sure. help me transition to bringing them into the conversation and some of the things you're doing? Sure. And um, I'm joined by Chad Cotter, our terrific new director of talent acquisition. He's on he's on the um, um, on the webinar as well. So we've done a few things. We did a um, hourly wage initiative in Maine. We raised our minimum wage to $18 an hour and $20 and 25 cents in Connecticut and California. So that's been helpful. Um, we are, um, we, we do have many open positions as uh, Chad would say, I think we've filled several hundred this year and our goal is to actually fill 800 positions this year. That's much higher than usual. 
Um, it's more in the 350, 400 range. So it's a combination of attrition um, and growth. So Toby, to your point, we are growing. Um, and when you do an acquisition uh, of, a, of a fairly large company in Japan, you also need the resources here to work with them and to onboard those people. So we'll have more res resources for our international operations as well. Um, we are having trouble in certain areas. Um, training is needed in the area of technicians, technologists. There aren't enough trained people in our diagnostic lab, our genotyping lab, our surgical technologists, our cell biology technologists. Those are all areas we're having a hard time recruiting for. Um, they, we need hands-on experience in high throughput labs. And I was talking to a scientist the other day and she said, you know, even sometimes when you hire someone, they might look good on paper, but she got the person in the lab and they had probably like I would, you know, two left thumbs and they, they actually couldn't do the pipettes and, and, and couldn't do the uh, uh, work in the lab that we needed. So that's a training issue that we, we need to think about. Um, we need further training in general lab practices, like I said, and the skill set of computational science is really hard for all of us. And this is where the Rue Institute's gonna help us. Um, data, it's all about data. When you study genomics and the human genome, um, it's all about data. It's, it's just massive amounts of data that we're processing. And so the IT needs are going up, the data scientist needs are going up, and that's why we're so pleased to be a founding partner of the Rue Institute and, and working together with them. Um, so those are some of the challenges we're having. So frontline workers, uh, tech, technicians, IT, I would say are the biggest areas. Um, and in the world, like you said, of mass resignation and uh, retirements, um, it's hard to hire. And also our best employees are getting uh, recruited daily, the ability to work remotely. Um, I had one person say that she gets recruited every day by outside companies and we wanna do everything to have her stay here. Yeah, great, thanks. So I wanna bring yeah, Eileen and Dan into the conversation. Um, I, either of you can jump in. Uh, thanks, thanks, Katie, There's a lot, a lot of fodder in there. I, I might ask Dan to start with that 800 number that, that Katie mentioned, because I know in, in preparation for this call, there have been other companies in the life sciences that community college has uh, developed programs for and addressed large workforce needs. So um, maybe with, with that plug, let you jump in. Absolutely. Well, thank you. I, I think one of the, you know, the things that, that we did as the pandemic um, came upon us in March is we pivoted um, um, to online delivery and, and we're back into the, the hybrid online and in-person training. But what happened around workforce training for us is we thought about how we can do things a little bit differently um, than we have in the past. And as, as the pandemic hit us, we got approached by Hospitality Maine saying um, they need to restart um, their, their hotels and restaurant operations. So we developed a COVID readiness badge, micro-credential. And we did that with Hospitality Maine. We did that with Ski Maine, uh, Goodwill of Northern New England, and Maine Indoor Air Quality Council. Um, as of Tuesday, we, we've issued 13,000 micro-credentials around COVID readiness. And that was a really successful um, project for us in response to COVID-19, but it also proved um, that we could actually produce um, and train folks and in micro-credentialing. So I think that's gonna be part of our future moving forward. But if we look at one of our really cool shining examples um, in May of, of 2020, Puritan Medical came to us and said, listen, we're opening up a facility in Pittsfield, Maine. Um, we have a second facility that will open up and we need folks trained um, to um, help us produce the swabs um, in, in the testing process for, for COVID-19. So, so between May and July, we partnered um, and worked together. Um, and as of now, we've trained 1400 folks um, for that facility, those two facilities. And we have some other really cool examples in manufacturing as well, whether it's um, Bath Ironworks um, to train manufacturing technicians or welders. Um, but we were able to pivot um, and increase the volume by partnerships. And anything that we do of, of any success is including as many partners as possible. So um, last year we trained um, through June 30th, um, over uh, 6,200 individuals and over 500, uh, over 
um, 105 projects um, in the last 12 months and found huge success um, working and partnering with businesses. And we have some, some new funding that's come to us and be glad to hit that um, as time permits us today. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, yeah, Eileen, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I love to hear all the things that the community, co community college system is doing because it's really a robust one here. And I think um, what we enjoy is, is we, we're doing similar things, but we're also working in tandem with them. So I think um, one thing is, is within a lot of organizations, and we, we talk about the quote, this is the generation of the great resignation. So if you look at why a lot of people have been changing jobs, a lot of times it's at the core of, of wanting to seek out more professional development in their own institutions that they don't always have access to. So we've seen a huge interest from our partner organizations to bring in different type of customized curriculum that can allow them to not only continue working for organizations that they really enjoy working at, but also advance some of their understanding of different ideas such as project management, data analytics, data visualization. And so a lot of our classes will also integrate work that they're actually, they, can, they can take work in from their institutions so that they might be able to work on something that's important to them about their own data visualization of, of data that they're working on in their jobs. And so that also enhances their um, professional development and just enjoyment and retention within their organizations. We also are exploring micro-credentialing, right? So a lot of people are very interested in maybe taking certain classes, but may not necessarily wanna go in for an entire degree. So we have a, a program that will allow people to actually stack credits. So you can take certain courses one at a time and over time, should you decide that that's something that you want to get a degree on, you can actually backwards um, stack those uh, the, those credits back into a degree for later. So we're trying to really offer a much more flexible opportunity for and the low barrier to entry into these different educational programs. Great, thanks, that, that's helpful. Uh, we do have a, a question in the chat box here on um, the future pipeline. So there are you know, labor needs that we have now and you guys are doing incredible things to try to match uh, personal professional fulfillment, training needs, recruitment, retention, um, but are there larger cultural shifts that are needed or, you know, it, so right now I brought both of you into this panel for sort of meeting workforce needs of, of today in the very near future. Should I have brought on somebody else that can talk about what's going on in, in the elementary schools and the high schools? Do you know of programs in the STEM sciences? Certainly we, we heard earlier and Agnieszka, I don't know if you want to jump in on the high school programming that's going on right now, but maybe first I'll give an opportunity for the panelists to respond. So um, I see Rick Wilson asked a question. I think it's the same Rick Wilson from Brunswick. Um, so Rick, great question. Um, we at JAX do have affiliations with the local high schools. We absolutely see the high schools as a pipeline and we're the largest employer in Hancock County. Reaching out to other high schools around the state might be problematic in terms of getting people to um, Mount Desert Island. So we tend to, our, our focal point would be Ellsworth, Bucksport, um, and obviously Bar Harbor schools. Uh, we have a summer student program that starts with kids in junior in high school to junior in college, and that's an international, very competitive program to get um, students here for the summer. They get to stay here, live, and they live here. We feed them the whole thing. Um, and the juniors in high school, and seniors in high school tend to be interested in the life sciences or medical school for college. So it's also great on their resume, but we hope that, that, that they'll come back afterwards. So um, I, I think to your question, could we do more? Probably we were going to do a high school internship program um, right before the pandemic hit um, and actually pay students to be um, interns. The internship world for high school students has changed and that it's, you know, there are no free internships anymore. Uh, they're quite competitive, especially if they're college bound or thinking about college, they, they want you know, the best inter internship program they can get. But I think it's, it's something that this group and um, Focus Maine, we, we, should, we, we do talk about the colleges and universities a lot, um, but we, we can't forget about um, starting young. I mean, what do they say, if you, you, know, you start young in the sixth grade and, and um, even younger can inspire people um, especially young girls to go into STEM. 
Yeah, it's a it's a great question. I and I and I think the 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 key is is um, you know how how do we engage um, those folks? We do have dual enrollment programs that are happening um, at our at our high schools, which um, those folks are taking um, college courses. Um, the interesting thing around that is is how do we hyper focus that um, for those students to the degree pathways. Um, because what we're seeing around dual enrollment is about 40% of those students um, don't move on um, to further education. And then, and to comp compound that is another 40% of high school students who don't move on to higher education or training um, within the first year of departing high school. So how do we um, make those connections with those students stronger and illustrate the pathways um, that are available and make sure they're transparent to the students so that they understand how to make those connections. But it's an absolutely great question. And, and we're not gonna be able to move the needle without um, partnering with our friends in, in K through 12 and our, our um, technical high schools and adult education. Great, so there's another really interesting question that came in from David Eagleson asking about you know all of these individualized programs sound sound awesome and they might meet you know individual needs of companies but it might not be super efficient and so are there are, are we aware of any efforts going on at the state level to say okay for the biosciences as a whole for the life sciences what are workforce training needs now what are they of the future um, what are gaps and i know from a focus main perspective this is an incredible question that we have been working collaboratively with others to try to address both in aquaculture and in the food economy. And I know in the in the biosciences, we're part of some grants that nip at the edges of this, but not a comprehensive workforce development strategy. So um, anyone on the panel wanna respond? I mean, I think what he's asking is, a great question and we have not done something formal but i think one of the things that we do at the rue is we believe in um, significant customer discovery and what we've been trying to do is understand what the needs are of the current community in the life sciences whenever we talk to our partners so that we can start to aggregate what are the consistent needs so um, we're a little bit farther along in terms of like com computer science and data analytics where it's become clear that there are certain companies that want specific specific skills that we've been able to now hone down on the uh, curriculum. In terms of the life sciences, we've been talking to a lot of the different companies and we've actually established, at least for our biotech program, sort of a main biotech education consortia working with people from uh, JAX, IDEX, M MMCRI, and um, Bigelow Labs to really have a group of people thinking about that. And what we're doing is we're reviewing curriculum and hoping to iterate that over time so that it can actually address the needs of the specific community within the state of Maine. But again, we need to think about two things, right? So there's um, supporting the community that's ongoing and current here. And then as we dis as we draw in more life sciences, organizations and industries thinking about what can do that and I um, what those things are. And so one of the grants I think, Toby, that you're referring to is, you know, we're successful at bringing biomanufacturing at scale to Maine that will also influence um, the things that we're doing. Great. And I know in, in preparation for this call, we not in a comprehensive way, didn't touch on it, but we talked about, you know, the animal, uh, you know, the health, animal health and veterinary sciences being, you know, such an important uh, subsector in Maine and how a lot of the training for that is so transferable to lots of different life sciences, industries and, and jobs and, and companies like yours, David, and and, and, you know, the links to manufacturing. And so I think, you know, Dan had mentioned, you know, some of the uh, you know, vet tech kind of programs and some of those, you know, on ramps into the STEM fields. Um, it, it would be great if they're communicated in a way that lets somebody know that, you know, yes, there might be training for a specific position, but it's a much broader, um, you know, training opportunity that fits into workforce development for the whole industry. So I think it's a, a really good point. Um, more questions coming in. A uh, question from uh, Zainep at Mitzi. So she runs a program called Study Main, which helps high schools and universities attract international students to the state. Wanted to find out if Jackson IDEX are open to hiring international students, and if they're opening, uh, if they are open to OPT, optional practical training, which allows STEM students to work with their student visa up to three years for non-STEM or non-STEM for a year. International students. 
Yeah, certainly. Um, we'd love for you to reach out to us. I just emailed you our um, a contact at Jack's. Um, it's hard sometimes to get the international students here with the visa issues, but it sounds like Mitzi is doing a good job there, and we'd love to work with you. That uh, same is true for IDEX. Yeah, we have um, a fair number of international um, workers already, and that's not really a barrier. Um, always looking for qualified candidates, regardless of <laughs> any, uh, you know, visa or issues like that. We're willing to work through that for sure. Great, thanks. Um, another question related to this gig work program that I thought was really cool too. I think everyone in the audience is thinking, geez, how can I get my workplace to pay for this little side gig I have going on? Um, or you know, opportunities for, for other side gigs that help, help advance the company. Um, are there any efforts to recruit other traditionally marginalized groups into the workforce, uh, such as reintroduction to the workforce? Maybe, uh, not sure, Dan, if you wanna sure. start with this one or, or anyone else. Yeah, so, so as we look at our landscape, obviously there's, there's a huge need across um, every single sector. And um, what, what we are doing and, and part of um, the main jobs and recovery um, funding that we received and through the um, new gift through the Harold Alfon Foundation is looking at entry level training, but also looking at training those incumbent workers. We have to be able to, to, to be in, in, in search of all of those marginalized populations, those folks departing corrections, those folks in recovery, um, those folks with um, some challenges or disabilities, or, or, or our older adults who um, still are facing the stigma um, of not getting callbacks um, because of their age. So um, we're working um, diligently in partnering with all organizations um, to be able to access those folks and help them um, bridge the skills gap to, to get them into a job of meeting and then continue the relationship with them um, as they work their way through that lifelong learning process. And, and I, I think that's the area we're, we're gonna have to stay in and be in. Um, and, and we've developed what we call the Main Workforce Development Compact, um, where we're, we're engaging um, our business partners and, um, and providing free um, professional development training um, to give them additional skills so they can move up um, engage, and, and engage um, increased wages. Um, we're also through the Harold Alfon grant going to be providing over 3,200 free college courses to those incumbent workers. So those courses can tie into life science courses um, and then be able to transfer into other opportunities in bachelor and master degree attainment. So for the lifelong learning, there was a follow up question on, you know, over 50. So do you see, you know, particularly in the in the STEM fields, do you see continued interest from older workers? Are there any deliberate efforts that you have to engage this group? Uh, yeah, I, I think some some of it is a, is a mixed bag. There are some very basic training needs for for some folks who've been who've been um, adversely affected by COVID-19 and some of those jobs have disappeared. Um, and then the need for them to get that, that retraining. But I, I also think, you know, we've got 186 Mainers with some college um, and no degree. And, and, and we've got to access that population so they can get degree attainment. And I think if, if we're able to um, connect with them and provide them um, additional education and then pathways into life science, science um, opportunities, I think they're huge. And, and you know, we, we have some community college students who, who obtain a degree and then decide to go into life sciences. And I think the, the partnership with Rue and, and others can, can help um, build, build additional folks into that pipeline. If I could jump in here for a second, um, the HEART program I mentioned, actually we, we've planned three phases and I described a little bit the first phase. Um, which is employees that we already have that have degrees that maybe they aren't utilizing at all or fully. Um, sort of once we, <laughs> we're about a year into it, so we're, you know, working through that phase. So the next phase is on the horizon pretty soon is folks that have incomplete degrees. Um, and, and um, you know, we're looking to finish uh, those degrees and then help them, you know, move, you know, ideally <laughs> still at IDEX um, into a job where they can fully utilize the degree. That. 
Um, and a piece of that would be, you know, we were updating our tuition reimbursement program and stuff like that. So we're really interested, um, you know, to work with you guys on that to make sure we're headed in the right direction. Cause I think that that describes a lot of people um, that sort of, for whatever reason, need some support to finish their degree, whether it be tuition reimbursement, flexible scheduling, other kind of support, really interested in providing that. Toby, I think uh, Dan's bringing up a really good point on the training and that I think more and more, we're just going to have to do bespoke training programs to get the people we want. And, um, you know, trying to find people is sometimes a needle in the haystack, um, especially really technical uh, skills. So I think, I think the silver bullet's gonna be working with everybody on this panel and, and other colleges and universities and high schools in the state in developing customized training programs um, so that people can come in regardless of age and get the, the training they need to be a successful employee. I mean, you, you don't just wake up one day and decide you wanna be a computational scientist, right? Um, you, you need a lot of training. Um, ditto for working in a wet lab and getting those skills. So I think the future of success in workforce development will be really leveraging people in Maine. And we've got ready, willing and able partners on this call um, to have those customized training programs because just the general recruiting, um, you know, putting your, your job out there on Indeed or otherwise is not gonna find that the, the number of people that you need. I think we can do this together as well. I think, I think there are opportunities, especially with the Ruse partnership model, where you know, I'm sure Juliet Idex is looking for the, many of the same types of workers we are, and we could share that information together. Yeah, great. No, and, and, and to bring the small business perspective into it too, you know, there are a lot of small businesses and on the, David's point that he put in the chat box that might not be able to work as you know, formally uh, with you know, different training programs, but also has have similar needs. And so, you know, are we aware of any, you know, clearing house for bioscience interns? So certainly there are, there are a few that come to mind, but um, maybe, so one quick example from my past, I was 10 years in biotech uh, before doing other things. And we had worked among uh, other organizations with, with Northeastern, their co-op model. And my goodness, some of those interns would come in and we would put them to work and, and the breadth of things that they could work on as an intern was likely very different than what they would work on with, with a large organization where they're, you know, they're expected from day one to be, you know, a full employee contributing on everything from their, you know, individual project they were brought in to do to, you know, commercialization and business development and, and lots of other things. And so maybe Eileen, if you want to speak a little bit to, you know, the co-op program and how, you know, you have access, you know, not just to the Rue talent, but the, the rest of the Northeastern network and the potential to work with, you know, some small businesses and place those, those co-ops there. Yeah, the co-op opportunities are, uh, you know, Northeastern strength is, is the co-op program because it's one of the oldest co-op programs in the country. The beautiful thing is that we, as of what we call the global university is that students from all of the different campuses have access to the co-op programs. Um, and it's, uh, for those of you who are, are not familiar with it, it's basically where the students have to apply for a job the same way they would any other position. It's a six month duration on average. It can be sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, usually works on an academic calendar, but doesn't necessarily have to. Students uh, in the entire uh, Northeastern network have access to the repository of all jobs. Um, companies that post something there are not required to hire someone. It's just like, I mean, you would do it for your typical talent. Students are paid as a company employee during that time. And then, um, then they go back to school after that. Our undergraduate students do anywhere from two to three co-ops at a time. I mean, over their duration of their degree, the master's students will do at least one uh, and PhD students are now starting to do them as well. So um, if anyone in the community is interested in posting something, feel free to let me know and we can get you hooked up to have it put into the system. Um, and then there are um, some opportunities for the, um, the RU to be able to co-fund co-ops with uh, partners within the state of Maine. So we are getting close to time. Thanks everyone for contributing uh, questions in the, in the chat box and hopefully we got to a lot of them, but I, I do wanna give everyone on the panel an opportunity for, for some closing thoughts. We talked about some sticky issues around workforce and all the great things that are happening, but 
would be curious for any yeah, closing thoughts around how Maine might be better positioned now to address some of these issues than than before, or what what you see um, moving forward. So any any closing thoughts, and I'll open it up. Whoever would like to to jump in first. I'll, I'll just be. Go ahead, Dan. Sorry, I, it just a just one thing that that we're seeing huge success in in in. And it's thinking differently about how we engage and train Maine's workforce. The healthcare, the healthcare partners that we're working with and others who are thinking differently about hiring a cohort of folks and allowing them to be in training and then work part-time for them, but providing them 40 hours a week and benefits is seeing really good results. We also have some examples of employers providing stipends for folks being in training. And that's also seen some incredible results. So thinking differently about how we engage the workforce from someone who's in that minimum wage job who's stuck and wants to advance. I think there's some really bright lights there. Um, and I think there's some really good collaboration going on. And, and, and this conversation is just part of those many conversations that can happen. And, 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 being, and being fully engaged with business partners is, is how we're gonna be able to do this collaboratively. Yeah, I would just add to Dan, I mean, I was gonna give the example of an animal care worker when they come in at $18 an hour, it's really about 18, 16 to 18 months become, before they become fully proficient in an animal room. And so that's a lot of training. They can get up to about $26 an hour when they're fully trained. So that's a, that's a long period of time to become fully functional. And, and those are the people you wanna retain. We have used the stipend route that Dan just talked about, especially in Maine. Um, so we do think stipends are, are good. I think my, my closing comment would be, we've got to keep this going. We've got to figure out ways to formalize these. You know, it's great to have this panel discussion. So thanks to, to Toby and Inesca for organizing it. But now we, we, we don't want it to be one and done. We've got to carry on, um, figure out ways to, to, to create more formal collaborations. Uh, Maine's a small state. My experience is, is, you know, we're uniquely situated to work together and get things done. Um, and I think Maine is, is already a life sciences hub, if not a vet, veterinary hub um, with, with all, with Covetris, with IDEX, with JAX. Um, so let's use that uniqueness to attract workers, um, but, but let's keep the momentum going and figure out ways that um, we, don't, um, we don't just have a talk about it, but we actually do things. It feels like we have a lot of ad hoc programs sometimes for me and um, pulling it all together is, is really critical, you know, hearing from Mitzi and, and the high schools, um, I get really excited to think there are all these things we can do. So I think the future is bright and I think remote work um, will help us. Um, uh, it doesn't matter where you are. Um, as long as we can fix that, um, those cell phone towers that don't work in Augusta and Hancock County, I'll be happy. So thank you. Um, I could um, just a little add on to a little bit of that. Um, I agree with everything that's been said and just like on a little bit of a personal note to underscore why I think this is so important. I agree with that. We don't want this to be a one and done. And I think Maine is really well positioned um, uh, to do some of these programs, particularly reaching um, uh, into uh, you know high school and maybe even earlier um, to recruit people. So I'm from rural Ohio. My father is a steel worker. No one in my family has ever been to college and I have a doctoral degree. You might wonder how that happened. I will tell you how it happened. I went to a summer program between my junior and senior year in high school. Um, it was the first time like out of Ohio, I went to Northwestern in Chicago for a STEM program. It was like a six or eight week program. And I was able to take little bites of things. I had six weeks of genetics, um, you know, and it was professors or teaching assistants basically, you know, that were teaching. So I had genetics, game theory, calculus. It was the first time I ever heard about biochemistry, we didn't biochemistry, you know, in rural Ohio, I'd never met a biochemist or a scientist. And then, you know, just that experience. And that basically, you know, drove me to, um, you know, spend a million years in college and a ton of money and, you know, put myself through college and, and things like that. So the impact, the importance of these programs cannot be overstated. Certainly, you know, for me personally, um, these kind of programs are everything. So thank you to everyone. So I'm going to plus one Julie's comment about uh, STEM programs for uh, younger students, because I also had the same experience where 
I went to a program at Virginia Tech in seventh grade and I got to make um, bridges out of toothpicks and examine their structural um, capabilities. And that put me towards engineering. So it was absolutely incredible. The, um, what I want to say is that I think we have critical mass here in the state of Maine and enough. There's, you, we have the things that can bring about organizational change. We have urgency. We have um, the people that are interested in making success. And we have a belief from, I think, top down from government, uh, the state government down to see success. So I think this is the time for us to really um, hit a crescendo. And I'm so excited to be a part of it. So thank you. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks to the full uh, panel. Thanks for bringing us home there at the end. A lot of really positive uh, yeah, momentum and calls to action. Um, so thanks. Thanks again very much. Um, Agnieszka, I think at this point I am turning things over to you for some closing comments. Um, so I will turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Toby. Toby you did an amazing job moderating. I wanted to say thank you to all of our panelists. This was wildly interesting in my opinion. Also, Eileen and Julie, you should be poster child, poster children from Maine Bioscience Day, especially Eileen, because I mentioned that before, but for Maine Bioscience Day, we send scientists to schools in seventh grade and they do a hands-on activity and they get to wear the lab gear. And this year, the hands-on activity is going to be making a membrane out of soapy water with glycerin to explain coronavirus, the membrane, how it all works. So for us, it's a huge pain to be sending glycerin and soap to you know 50 schools in Maine, but we're doing it because we believe in that. We believe in that at least a couple of students will remember that for life and will think, wow, this is so cool. I wanna do this in the future. So that's just my little plug-in again about me by Science Day. Um, I think we're going to conclude. I see people are dropping a little bit. So I'm going to hand it over to Tom. Um, any closing thoughts, Tom? No, I just want to thank all of the speakers and everyone who attended. This has been great, wonderful collaboration. Always looking for ideas for future topics to cover. So if anyone has any great ideas, please put them in the chat or email uh, one of us. But it's been a fabulous collaboration, and uh, we really appreciate working with you. So have a great afternoon, everyone, and thanks for attending. Yeah, absolutely. And just for looking for the next two months, um, for Biomain, we have our coffee hour on November the 4th. Stay tuned for that. And then we'll probably do a holiday mixer in December, and the format of that is to be determined. But I'm open to ideas if anybody has any on how to do it successfully. Once again, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for sticking with us till the very end. And we wish you all a wonderful week, I guess. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.